Hi, and welcome to the Margie and Lisa show. I'm Margie Wigan. And I'm Lisa Jackson. And we have three exciting segments tonight. We're going to start with some invest in, investment advice with David Castillo. Then we're going to talk about sh how should you drive in flooded streets. And finally, we're going to talk with Chris Martell about what's in the summer sky. So, thank you for being here, David. Great, thanks for having me. I appreciate yeah. it. Happy thank to be you. here. Thank yeah. you. And it is kind of a different financial market right now. Yeah, it's 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 quite different. I mean, there's a lot of things. It's constantly evolving, though, which makes it interesting, exciting, but also too kind of the reason why you have me here to talk today is right. does, it does create you know volatility and questions and what do I do kind of thing. So yeah. right, yeah. different day by day, I think. Even. Right. Yeah. I mean, it seems politics are affecting the market a little bit more than they have in the past, possibly. Yeah, we're gonna say that. We're gonna say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. You know, and that kind of makes it. You know, and I think those of us. Most of us that watch the news, we're kind of like, oh, trade wars and different Tariff, things, so yeah, tariffs yeah. And, and things like that that are going on, it definitely, and interest rates and the normal stuff that affect the market, but yeah, no yeah, question. what is your advice for people out there that are trying to navigate this, because it's kind of uncharted territory? Well, I think, that, I think the first thing that, um, and this is, uh, Margie and I were having a conversation about this earlier as well, mm -hmm. is I think it's it's about being thoughtful about what's actually happening in the market, because unfortunately, we're, we're slaves to that 24-hour news cycle, yeah. so, and at the 24-hour news cycle, it's meant to kind of outrage you, to mm -hmm. inflame you, and and it kind of translates a lot of things. It can make you emotional um, and respond to things in, in a different way. Right. Um, like, like panic it, or well, get angry or... Well, yeah, I mean, fear. Trust. Well, yeah, we'll trust, trust everything else. You know, those are all incredible motivators. Um, and what happens usually is fear. Um, mm -hmm. And I usually use fear as an acronym, uh, false evidence appearing real. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and to a great extent, that happens. Uh, we had a lot of volatility early in the year. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you hear a lot of talks about the VIX index, et cetera. But Can if you, you look, explain the VIX index? Yeah. Yeah. Again? Oh, the VIX index. What the VIX index is, is that there is a measurement of uh, measuring volatility in the equity markets. Uh, the S&P 500 is used uh, as kind of the world moniker for the U.S. Uh, equity markets. So the changes uh, that occur within that S&P 500, uh, that volatility, and they yep. measure that in an index, um, we'll use that uh, as a way to, um, well, you can measure it, but you can also buy and sell that as an option. So, oh. if, so if you were Does like, it is it a predictor? Of sorts well, it's, it's not or a predictor. A it's barometer more barometer of sorts. Or? It's it's a, a, a uh, volatility certainly is a barometer in so far as uh, what's happening in the market, yeah. but how it's used is, is is if you're a large portfolio manager, you know, say you run a fund at Fidelity that has exposure to the S and P 500, yeah. you may uh, buy insurance to protect yourself against it. Uh, one of the things that I talk about, um, and I'd mentioned it to uh, Margie earlier, is that uh, volatility to a great extent is almost like the weather. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to pass, sure. uh, and it's really it's going to affect it's going to affect <laughs> well, it's, well, it's going to affect you more the more vulnerable you are to that. Right. You know, like right. if it's going to rain and yeah. you don't have a roof, that's mm -hmm. going to be a big yeah. issue for sure. you, right? Um, so I kind of look at it like that. Yeah. Um, but if you look at like where we are for the year right now, I mean, all the major indices are up a couple of percentage points. Um, and for the year, for the year, thus and we're far. in August, we're almost in August, yeah. so for eight months. Yeah, and you is know that's that a normal percentage rate. I I invest very cautiously in mutual funds and things like that. Great, great. You know what I mean. But it, you know, is that a is that a normal rise and fall? Are you seeing a normal it's, market uh, now? I know we hear things on the news, and it it's one market, one news station says it's very good, and others yeah. say it's more volatile. It, and then the other yeah. question is: Is there a normal, yeah. or is it just is it unpredictable, and you can't really right. over time? I think it grows. Different steadily. industries grow. But I think if there's so much up and down in a given well, no, year. Well, is there a normal? There, there, there's, there's a normal pattern of behavior, and okay. the market has expectations, whether it's of, uh, you know, the market participants, you know, whether it's the different banks in the market, uh, whether it's the corporations that you follow, mm -hmm. um, by their being public companies, they have to report earnings and information on a regular basis, so there's expectations with that. Mm -hmm. um, there's expectations from, you know, the performance of, you know, of governments and how they do things. Right. Um, and all those things kind of filter into what that normal is, mm -hmm. um, and we've now broken way out of what normal is now, um, <laughs> especially on the government side, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and so that kind of creates kind of a new frontier. Yeah. Um, but I would uh, I would point to um, 
I guess you know one of the best market pundits uh, that you know I, I can refer to is Abby Joseph Cohen, uh, mm -hmm. the Goldman strategist, um, and she kind of thinks about it the way I kind of explained it to you, that you know we're you know we're okay, equities are what they are, and we could talk about valuations right. um, relative uh, in the markets. Uh, but you know we're moving along slowly. The, the bigger fears in the market right now, um, from a volatility, what could create volatility in the markets, is the rising interest rates. Sure. Um, and we right. could talk about what causes that. And, and that's then, how it's, and we've had incredibly low interest rates for right. very, very we're long lucky. time. You know, generationally so, low. Yeah. yeah I uh, mean, like I just, yeah, I won't be 50 next year, and I'm like. You know, over the years that I've watched, I would have said twenty nine. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's very kind of you. Um, but no, you you look at you know over the years interest rates. I know when I bought my house, the interest rate was much much higher yes. than the interest rate that I have now. Six or seven, right? You know, and it seems like credit card interest rates are there. Also, mm -hmm. you know, like general, you know, savings accounts, CDs, things like that, are rather low. Well, the, yeah, the general level of interest yeah. rates are low and have remained low yeah. for such an extended period. Because remember, in September 08, we ostensibly almost hit the reset button yes. in the financial markets. 2008 was. Yeah, and you know, crash. we call the, uh, you know, probably the benchmark for where we started this current market is March 09. It's mm -hmm. kind of like our bottom mm -hmm. um, okay. relative. And what um, the Fed has done in, in concert with um, really world uh, central banks around the world is to keep interest rates very reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, and really, over the last couple of years, there's been tremendous pressure on the Fed to begin raising interest rates, which they've right. been doing. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And what that is, is is their anticipation putting on the brakes. Right. Um, because we do have an economy that's growing well. Right now, expectations for GDP, um, which will be announced on Friday, is around the 4% level, plus or minus. So, so the gross domestic product. Yeah, and that is how our growing economy is growing every year. It's yep. growing at 4%, yeah. which so is pretty good. Can yeah. I ask, um, so Janet Reno was the head of the Fed, or was she? No, was no, Janet Reno, she was, she was a former she, attorney general at a long time but ago. Who yeah. was the one that? Janet Yellen. Janet Yellen. Oh, Janet yeah, Yellen. Yeah, Janet Yellen. Well, Reno Yellen. Yeah. So Janet Yellen yeah. was the one who dis who decided if the rates were going to go up? Well, no, the way that works the, is is Janet Yellen was the head of the Federal Open Market Committee. Yeah. Um, and that's a group that meets every six weeks. Yeah. Um, and what they do is is they meet is together. Is it a governmental committee or is it It's, a, it's actually the Fed is an independent Fed. entity yeah. from the government, which kind of creates insulation Good. so there's not political pressure on sure, the decision yeah. making. Mm -hmm. um, and what the Fed does is it has the Federal Reserve Chairman mm -hmm. um, and then it has a series of governors from around the country. Uh, mm -hmm. There's Federal Reserve Banks that report in of the economic activity based on the data that they assimilate or that they take in um, on a regular basis from a variety of sources they kind of create expectations of what we think future growth will be yes. mm -hmm. and then on top then they will have interest rates rise or fall on top of that now they don't actually move interest rates all they do is they actually control mm -hmm. the fed borrowing window what banks are charged to mm -hmm. borrow money and then their expectations is is that filters through the entire system. All right, and, and did Alan Greenspan have something to do with? He was a well-celebrated Federal Reserve Chairman back in the 90s, um, yeah. in the 2000s. Um, he made some of those famous comments that we now um, look at as being somewhat interesting at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but well-celebrated, brilliant guy. Mm -hmm. uh, read his book. It's actually really interesting. You want to hear kind of okay. some of the inside What's thoughts. What's his book called? Um, it's actually read. It's it's actually his biography. Oh, okay, Greenspan. the biography. Yeah. So yeah. just I just want to take a quick break and say encourage people to call in. So oh, if yes. you have questions yes, for David, he's very experienced. Has done investment, um, banking, and brokering, and worked for many yeah. prestigious uh, companies. And uh, has been an advisor on CNBC and I forget what else you said. Uh, Fox Business Fox News. Fox Business well, News, know, yes. So if you have a question Uber. or you have a comment yeah, about our volatile market, there should be a number on the bottom of the screen. Call in, uh, send us a, shoot us an email, live at hcam.tv, so we can include you in the conversation. Yes. That's what we're all about. So anyway, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Just, no, I have good, a thank you. question for you. So Certainly. our national debt is getting quite high. Yeah. How does that affect, I mean, what is your concerns about that? Because to me, well, I don't like debt. I pay cash for almost as mm -hmm. much as things as I can, which I know is not always advisable, but but anyway. Um, but the national debt keeps, seems to keep to be climbing. Is that a problem? In the future, uh, I mean, is that something that's going to affect us down the road? Certainly. I mean, we always have to be concerned about budget deficits, yes. and I think we have to be thoughtful in our spending, um, but I think that's consistent across the board. Um, the federal deficit and our national debt is not necessarily a bad thing. 
Um, for the individual, certainly you want to manage and control debt. And yes, paying cash for things and, and being smart about your finances is appropriate. Yes. But you have to remember that um, the U.S. debt is also a very effective instrument of foreign policy. Right. Um, because we borrow money. Yeah, because we, we borrow money from around the world. Right. Um, and right now, right now, the U.S. dollar, albeit, and therefore the U.S. government debt, is really the safest investment in the world. Um, so by us having all that debt, what it does is it allows countries, institutions, individuals. To invest in our country. It's really kind of a safe house for the world's, um, um, you know, value of resources. And if you look at it, it actually influences. It actually influences our general level of interest rates. Yeah. Um, and keeps them somewhat artificially lower, mm -hmm. because as volatility increases in the world, people are looking for a safe place where right. they know their money's going to be safe. And our market continually kind of. Well, luckily, our market has continued to move up. Yeah, well, you know, March 09 is is the bottom, and since then, the equity markets have sensibly have tripled. Okay. So it's been a wonderful time to be an investor. If you had assets, you know, yeah. you're doing great. Yeah, yeah and I, I heard something about 14% growth over time annually. I don't know if that's right. That would be a, that would be a um, that would be a really that would be out that's of wrong. control. Okay. Yeah, that would be so a big is it, So, okay. So I guess what I I guess the other thing I heard was. Um, the advice of tortoise and the hare, so that if you just keep your money, keep investing <laughs> well, moderately yeah, totally over time. Exactly. What I was going to get at too, because we started this segment off and talking about market volatility and how to invest yeah. and stuff. Really, and I, you know, I like to have people think about it. First, ideally, if you're an investor, it means you have a goal or a plan on where you'd like to be with that investment. Yep. And ideally, you have an advisor or professional consult you. Um, if you're an institution, you know, I dealt with, like, my experience is really in the capital markets, and every large hedge fund or, you know, mutual fund, they had reams of individuals and professionals who all they did was research and analysis. Uh -huh. um, so no one in person is smarter than the market. Right. So I strongly suggest that. Like, and I can also explain it like this. If you don't have a professional helping you, like, when your toilet gets backed up and you got a problem, do you try to fix it or do you call a plumber? Right. I usually try to fix it. Yeah, you, you call a plumber usually. Um, <laughs> yeah, because like, I don't want to have to, like, I don't want to well, talk about it. Well, and also know your skill set on that, too. Yeah, you exactly. know what I mean? Exactly. So I just, yeah. I, you yeah. know, I look at certain things you let the professionals do. You know, I have expertise in certain things. That's not it. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? So, you know what I mean? Well, it's like really and I'm very cautious, per se, so I may underinvest. You know what I mean? That's so, just conservative, but more yeah. so, like, I, I, I bring the point up and suggest this only because if you have a goal and objective, mm -hmm. then what happens is if this weather that I call volatility happens to come through and you've got a plan, say the market gets right. really hit hard and say you like a particular equity of a particular sector that you're very enthused yeah. about yeah. and it goes on sale. That's you get an opportunity to buy it cheaper. Right. Right. And remember, cars go on sale, food goes on sale, yeah. clothes go on sale. Right. Sometimes securities go on sale. And that's if you've got it. So that's an interesting way to look at it because you watch yeah. sales. So and jump into the market when it's at a low. Yeah. Well, yeah, we'll be thoughtful. And relatives. how do you watch that you know? market? I mean, I guess how do you, I mean, all of us see the S&P and all that going, NASDAQ, all that it's just, bantering it's, when you watch the news. Yeah. I mean, how is it? digestible for the average person if you do have an interest in a market. Obviously, you work with someone that's a professional, yeah. but and how, ask, how do ask, you kind of... Ask that person a lot of questions. I mean, yeah. wear, wear them out. I mean, the one thing that we have is we have we have a tremendous, tremendous securities industry in this country. It's like the, the what we have here is unlike anywhere else in the world. Can you um, define it a little bit? Well, more? because the regulatory process we have, I mean, the SEC is wonderful with what they do. Securities we have a self regulation. Yeah, and we have a we have a regulatory self regulatory organization in the industry, Finra, um, yep. mm -hmm. which kind of keeps everybody in line. Um, we have the rule of law here in this country, which really protects you know not only the institutions but also the individual. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got a real opportunity to take advantage of this great system, and what you can do is just ask your financial representative. So when all this is happening, you'll kind of know what's going on. And, you know, remember whenever those times where you feel discomfort or weakness. That's a great opportunity to learn something new. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, because right. like in these times of weakness, like bank something for a rainy day. Mm -hmm. Like you've got this new knowledge and stuff. Yeah. So instead of being fearful, just know that it's going to be the sun's going to come out tomorrow. Kind yeah. of. And by yeah. the way, the sun does always come out tomorrow. Yeah. I've been through. <laughs> You know, since 1986, I've been through quite a few opportunities to hit the reset button. I've been through different financial crises. And really, I've kind of 
my career has been predicated upon capitalizing on those market dislocations. Mm -hmm. right. um, and that's when you want to buy stuff. Mm -hmm. nobody, nobody likes to pay full price. But it's such a, the market's so interesting to me too because even when you buy stuff that's cheap or you're investing in that company so that helps that company do better, correct? Well, does, it does it work that way? I mean, like in a way. Some no, what you're doing is, is you're when you buy when you buy equity in a company, what you're doing is, is you believe that that company does something and does it well. Yeah. And based on their ability to do profit, that, yeah. they'll profit in some way, and you'll benefit from that. Whether it's the entire market realizing that and the company stock rises, yep. right. or it could be in paying you dividends. Yep. Um, there'd be a variety of ways to realize a return from that. But yeah, you benefit from that. Um, yeah. but, but you're not. But you're giving cash to operate, and then you benefit from their profits. Right. Right. It's so, so interesting. Yeah. yeah. So in so in a volatile market, would there be some safe bets to invest in in terms of businesses? Well, in general, or in a volatile stocks. market, you got to first you got to ask where the volatilities come from. Mm -hmm. Like, what's happening right yeah, now? Why is the market volatile? Um, and certainly, there's a huge political component yeah. right now with that. Um, and there's also two fundamental issues relative to like the general level of interest rates rising. Right. Um, and you know, this then just in general, I mean, you know, um, we've got like. Tremendous issues with the trade wars. That right, are, that so are it's up. not a good time to buy Alcoa. I will, uh, you know, like right tariff. now, the companies that can hammer today were uh, yeah. the, the automakers. Okay. Right. GM got hit, Ford got hit, Chrysler got hit. Hmm. You know, also with Sergio Marchione passing on, like yeah, they that's just, probably discounted somewhat. So to right. me, I'd be looking for if right. I was looking at the automakers, I'd probably be thinking about opportunities to add there. Mm -hmm. um, I'd also be looking at. Um, certainly, the steel makers think right. about that. Right. They're going to benefit because the tariffs on yeah. steel are local yeah. steel. Will be yeah, and so the tar you know, those steel companies are going to do better. Yeah. Unfortunately, this policy you can see is like, okay, the automakers are getting hit because we can't sell as much in China, but the steel makers Today. are going to do better <laughs> because they're going to be selling more expensive steel. Right. So what we're doing is, is we're ostensibly just charging the U.S. consumer more for goods and services. Right. It's, right. it's, kind it's of a really, and then you know, today just to go on a little bit on this point, you know, we introduced um, the idea, or I should say, the Trump administration introduced the twelve billion dollar, you know, farm subsidy right. bill. But we wouldn't have to do that if we, you know what I mean? Right. It seems counterintuitive. Absolutely. Um, but, and what I heard was that that uh, the commentary was that that may be a way to reassure the farmers in the middle of this whole tariff situation where soybeans are, you know, getting tariff and all these other things, so they're getting discouraged and, and well, that's I think he's just trying to buy, I mean, I can make a political statement here. Exactly. He's just trying to buy a political base. That's what yeah, I'm saying. Absolutely. You know, that's because if, if you talk But we are to, buying it. Well, well, and the other I'm thing is... Yeah, uh, <laughs> no, but, no, but any, I mean, we pay but if for you talk it. But yeah. if we talk to any farmer, yeah. the last thing they want is a subsidy. Uh, they want they're, a right, exactly. They're like the backbone of American economics. I know. And then the other thing is that the comment I was hearing was, I think it was NPR actually, was saying that the subsidies being given to the farmers, what about the steel workers? What about mm -hmm. the other people, iron work, whoever, who are, who are being Getting affected by well. this tariff? Well, it's like it's a really, it's not a good conversation. You're not going right. to get to a place that's going right. to be good for everyone. Right. And really the best thing that's good for everyone is let it happen. Yeah, like, yeah, that's a whole different discussion. But I mean, certainly this is causing a lot more cost and expense than the well, benefits. Well, and I think people right. think, and I, the Trumpism a little bit is America internal, mm -hmm. but we are a global market now. We are. Oh, I yeah. mean, we are all intertwined so closely, Welcome and we're so to. affected now by what each other does. We can't just make you unilateral decisions. It exactly. just it affects yeah. too many things. I completely agree. Yeah, yeah unilateralism is, is, is kind of dead. Yeah. You know, because um, it just, we have to work together. Right. Right. As a globe. Global yeah. economy and global. Absolutely. Yep. We have to. Yeah. Any last thoughts for... No, I think I'm really I'm thrilled what you guys do here. I think it's beneficial to the community, uh -huh. and I think that um, you know it'd be great Sweet. if you could get more people to interact and go with that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. like, we if I could be of any service to help you with this, oh, I would. We would love to have you. Yeah. We might have you come back. Yes. Yeah, 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 like, let's get people engaged. Like anything to. If we're all smarter, we're all going to be smarter. Absolutely. <laughs> you know I mean? And we all do better. I yeah. mean, it's a team. Yeah. Kind it's a team of, effort. Kind right. of. Yeah. So that's what I believe. Yeah. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we'll be back to talk about floods, driving floods. in water, driving in floods. <laughs> yeah. I, I just still have my brain is full of investing in lava. Yeah. yeah, we'll be back to talk about driving in flooded waters. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. All right.
through the health care and uh, insurance and all that. So I think the biggest question is Hi, so in this segment we are going to talk about how you should drive when there is torrential rain. The reason I thought of this yeah, we, you tell is the because yeah. I was driving home uh, late last week, I think it was, might have been Thursday, very, 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 very heavy rain mm -hmm. on Route 9. There are some underpasses yeah. where the water is yeah, very deep and yeah. I, all I could think was if I go really fast, <laughs> I'm going to get through it before the car dies. Because there are people behind me. So yeah. how could I pull off? I didn't know what to do. It is a hard dilemma. And, and for, I work in preparedness, so of course, this I drew I didn't know. There actually is a campaign by the National Weather Service that's called Turn Around, Don't Drown. Uh, that's what so, which I thought was kind of cute. Samantha said that too. Yeah, so I thought that was really cute. So, yeah. you know, you're stuck when you're in traffic. You can't turn around if there's people, a bunch of people you. behind you. And you and I talked about this. Like, how do you turn around? Like, what do you do? Like, do you sit there and wait for it to do your car away? Do you kind of back up and tell everybody else to back up behind yeah. you? Yeah. Um, the thing is, and you have a slow car. My cars are low to the ground. It, it's tough. So, six inches of fast moving water can knock off uh, an adult off his or feet, her feet. And sweep them away if you're walking. Yeah. So that's not very much. Yeah. But those of you that have been to the beach, if it's fast moving water, when sure. the tide pulls sure. out, yeah. granted you have the sand kind of curling under you, that that can knock you mm -hmm. off your feet. So I would even, think that would depend on your size. I would think a lot of things. Stamina. How heavy the person is. They, I think they use statistics. How, how good a gymnast you right. are. Like I'm pretty savvy in the water because yeah. I spend a lot yeah, of time I, in the water. Yeah. So 12 inches of moving water can carry a small car. I heard away. that, 12 okay. inches, yes. And then 18 to 24 inches can carry larger vehicles away, yep. Yep. trucks, SUVs, and vans. So really the thing is that, that really will help you in this is to be prepared. Right. So MEMA actually has an amazing alert system. MEMA is? A Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency. It's called a ping alert. Oh. You download it on your phone. It's an app, and it uses GPS to tell you when there's floods in the area. Yep. And it, it's extremely effective. And it actually works out of state, too, because they coordinate with other emergency management agencies. Mm -hmm. So that is one of your best bets, because that that is where you you get an immediate alert. As quick as so they the, know, you know. So the ping alert comes off. So the situation was, though, oh, I was yours, already yes. on Route 9. Yep. It and started to rain. Yeah. It rained torrential rains. Mm -hmm. And I was, I knew there were areas that would be, yeah. that had had trouble before. Yeah. And, and I just didn't know, what, should I take an alternative route? I don't right. know. And so. And that ping alert would, would have warned you. So the ping alert. But you, the, even if I was warned, well, I don't know that I would necessarily route. be but able again, to go it, anywhere. It tells you, so with the ping alert, it can even show you what roads are safe to drive. Oh, okay. But also, um, before a flood, you should know where your flood zones are. So, I mean, that's something to, I mean, I know it sounds overprepared, and I live and breathe preparedness, I'm sorry. No, it's not a bad so, thing. But it's, it's to understand what's, yeah. what's safe and Which where your children go. are safe. You know, it, ironically, there's some areas in every community we know that flood during the, mm -hmm. you know, during mm -hmm. a, a torrential rain. Yeah, and I'm not even sure it's a flood zone. It's just a lower it point under a... Under Edgel Street. I know yeah, exactly Edgel, where... But and, there's another one, too, at 27. Yep. Yeah. So what I was looking up, um, the thing I was worried about was 
a couple things. One, that my engine would get flooded from underneath, yeah, it takes or that water something in the would get in right. Quit. The intake yeah. valve would would just make my car dead in the water. Yeah. So my theory was, if I go fast enough, you're like a boat. <laughs> yeah, you develop a and wake. And there was a wake. I see that. There was I mean, a that big makes wake. Sense. That makes sense in my head too. Because, so I thought, if I just get to the other side, <laughs> right. And then as I was reading, it says, don't, don't produce a wake. No. Because then you're just spewing your water onto the people on the right. other side. Right, so you may cause the guy next to and you then, to... And then I wasn't sure if I go slowly, like Grandma, pardons to Grandma, if I went slowly, yeah. then it would just be dead in the water, literally. Right. So I wasn't sure what to do. Um, and I looked up some of that, too. Um, the thing with the intake valve, intake air intake, it creates hydrostatic shock or hydrolock. Pistons freeze, engine stalls mm -hmm. can create irreversible damage internally mm -hmm. <laughs> and even small amounts of moisture can cause it to stall sure. so i i honestly didn't know what the right thing was no i mean really it, it's 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 a tough thing a lot yeah. of it's preparation a lot of it's kind of getting those alerts so you know when there's flooding happening you pull over you stop well, at that trader was the joe's other thing. you know you go to trader joe's or you get it you're you know wherever you were you could stop off and get out of the way that's what i would do yeah and and you know what half of people that die in floods die in their cars right I read so that, too. that that is a big thing and yeah. we do have volatile weather yeah, like we have all little <laughs> financial markets and volatile yes, government. Yeah, yeah. Um, we do have those torrential rains that come down very, very quickly, and they right. can very. And we have we lived on, we live on a paved world. Exactly. You well, know, that was, like that's we, the problem. It's not going to drain anymore. Yeah, we don't. You know, the water doesn't get absorbed naturally like it normally would. Right. So yeah, like, that's what I was reading too. Because one thing that I read mm -hmm. said to get out of the car and leave the car where it was yeah the other thing that and the other thing that i read said stay in the car right so there's right. conflicting advice um, that's, this a, that's is, a tough one you, you know what i mean because the, and again you know they say avoidance is probably the best way around yeah but how do you avoid that you can't and sometimes you know, you once can't. you're in it what do you do right and so progressive says do not drive through standing water on roads or in parking lots you can be swept away in 12 inches of water like you said driving through it can stall the engine irreparable damage but and then it says do your best to estimate the depth of the water when you're gonna get out with the ruler well, and you and you watch the other cars going through i was trying right. to do that yeah. this says drive slowly and steadily through the water and i was i was not doing that but i mean in a way that makes sense so if you're under that 12 inches you're not creating the weight because the weight can also if you have to stop cool pull water back into I, your engine I know. so but it's but i see your theory i because i've I been there know. done that i've done know. it I'm i like, wish my car would convert to a boat that would right. be the best thing. so that except you know, not a duck boat right so this <laughs> also said avoid avoid driving in water that has downed electrical or power lines i've heard of people yeah. being electrocuted yeah, that, driving in water good... <laughs> and then watch for items traveling downstream yeah because um those you know, whatever those are called, the sewer caps, yep. lids can right. come loose and also and the, float. the road underneath can be damaged. Right. So where you can't see the road itself, the yep. road underneath also can be damaged and there can be debris in the road. Absolutely. And, and things or, like or that. whatever. And then it says when you've gone through the water, it, that is to your wheel rims or higher, test the brakes yep. when you get up out of there mm -hmm. just to make sure. And then they advised that if, the, if it wasn't working, you're supposed to hit the brake and the accelerator at the same time, which yeah, sounds Yeah, to dry kind of, it off. Yeah. It dries it off. So yeah. stay off the telephone, <laughs> probably because there's a little electrical thing there. If it stalls in deep water, you may need to restart it. Restarting may cause irreparable damage. So it's like, <laughs> no. what do you do? What do Avoid you do? Avoid it. I and mean, then this <laughs> is saying abandon it. This progressive yeah. insurance said abandon it. Yeah. Open the window, roll down the window, call 911. 50% of people die in floods in, in their in, car. And then, the, yeah. and then this other company, whatever it was, said to stay in the vehicle. So I think it's, I think it's really tough. You know, I mean, if tough. I, I mean, personally, and I live and breathe preparedness, if I was stalled in my yeah. car, wouldn't start, I would get out of it and go to a higher plane. Would you get on the roof of the car or would you it swim? It would depend on the situation. I mean, how strong yeah. the current was and, and what where I was. 
I mean, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, or if there's a tree nearby, I might swim to the tree. If there's a bunch of cars around me, I may stand on top of the car. Right. There, you know, it, it would you would have to do some critical thinking, obviously, and think about quickly. What's, yeah, quickly. Right. So, I mean, really, it, the the best way is to try to avoid it. I mean, and and yeah, and, and use the ping alerts are amazing. So the so I love the idea that the ping alert does it work kind of like Waze, and it would give you yeah, and actually Waze alternate- has an amazing tool to it um, and I used it during the March storms Mm -hmm. we could figure out what roads were open and Mm -hmm. closed through ways Mm -hmm. so they took national reports which I and I'm sorry this is an ad for ways but it really no it it, it really has a very great tool and they actually on ways it shows you where shelters are where police stations are where hospitals are and things like that But, I mean, really your best defense in a flood is to have, one, the ping alert, so your education, and then know where your right. where your areas are. I mean, I... What areas might be right. difficult. I know all the areas just because of the work I do, but you can yeah. go right online, and you, the actually uh, National nine. Weather um, Network has... You can click on an area, put in a zip code, and they'll show you where all the flood zones are. Well, and so, so that's fine, but if you're already on the road... Mm-hmm. And the rain is all all of a sudden looking because I didn't know yeah. that it would turn that bad that right, fast. So it was right. flash flood warning. Yep. Okay. Well, I don't know. Right. So so the ping um, would help in that situation. Right. I mean, Waze in that situation, you get up. Ways may would help in that situation. Take a little longer. Mm-hmm. Pings more f- quicker because yeah. it comes from NOAA. Yeah. So it comes right out of Taunton, and they do GIS, and they tell you where everything is mm-hmm. that they know about. Satellite. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, and they use all the um, tools that they have to mm-hmm. give you information on where the flooding's happening, where they expect it, yep. the timing of it is. It's usually about... 10, 15 minutes Pretty before quick. it happens. So, so just if, be aware. Yeah, and if anybody's know. watching, you have gotten stuck or you, you experienced this flash yeah. flooding thing, What'd you um, do? we'd love it if you <laughs> let us know where were you so we'll avoid that place. I know mine Mine was um, the underpass by Route 27 was one of them, and I think the Edgell Road underpass yeah, may have been yeah. the other one. I can't remember. But there were at least two in or Temple, three places do it. Yeah. Two or three places on Route 9 where it went and down and up again. Yeah. yeah, so it was really yeah. difficult. Route 9, I was trying to think, should I get off and get off? I just didn't know which way to go. So I mean, in, in, a in a flash flood situation, you would really, your best bet is to pull over and wait for it to pass. You know what I mean? And I guess my feeling about that was I didn't know how long mm-hmm. it was going to do that. Right. And I just and wanted again, to get home. And again, the ping alert will give you a time frame. Yeah. Oh. So the ping alert will say from three, we just had one in, in North Shore Cape Ann, and I was watching it as I was driving back because I didn't want to get stuck in it. Wow. Um, yeah, so that we had a ping alert, and it said from 357 to 415 in this area we expect torrential rain okay so of course you kind of watch the skies and if you're really smart and you're not on a timetable to get well, somewhere that, right i in. just wanted to get home yeah the safety yeah i mean i That's... i literally walked in right before the show came on so yeah. you know what i mean like i was on a timetable i probably wouldn't have pulled over yeah but uh, yeah you know the best advice really for safety is to mm-hmm. go to a high ground and, and yeah and wait i guess it out. i guess like you were saying if you know your route, if you have a familiar route that you always go, yeah, and most then of you us need do. to know where are the areas that might flood. And it's so easy and to And which find. way to, to avoid them, because we have had right. several cases of this flash flooding oh, yeah. recently. Oh, absolutely. And I know, you know, in other parts of the country, they've had terrible flash flooding. Oh, yeah. At least we have hills. <laughs> so right. it kind of goes somewhere. But, right. like, when it's flat, like my friends in Texas have been. The, oh, my gosh. It's been a nightmare Houston down there. just keeps getting oh, hit. Oh, yeah. With I mean, that they're, flood, they're, that flood they're a mess right for now. Sure. So, but, I mean, that's that's something to think about is really know those, yeah. those things. And you can look it up on mm-hmm. NOAA. Um, noah.org and you can you can look on there and you can actually hone in so noah is n-o-a-a yep so national uh, organization yeah. for mm. yeah i don't know sorry yeah. no that's okay i forget that acronym just because thank you thank national you national <laughs> oceanic Yes. And Atmospheric right, yeah. Administration, N-O-A-A dot org. Yes. Yeah, because some people might be calling Noah like in the flood. And you, you can tell, <laughs> Right. That's it's kind of ironic. Yeah, it's ironic <laughs> it's called that. But you could search the website and you could find out flood zones. Yeah. And they actually have a big map. It shows the, and I put, peeked at it because I was curious. So I peeked at it. So it's like 
the whole United States and you can almost like Google Earth, you can hone in. Nice. And you can kind of look at where your route is to your camp or my, yeah. where my route yeah. is to my meeting yeah. or, or I whatever. just had no idea it was going to be that bad. Oh, I know. So I, I being an optimist... You're like, I got or, this. Or a fool. Uh, I thought, oh, I can, yeah, I can do this. Yeah. My, car's, done it my too. car's not that low. That doesn't look yeah. that deep. I've, I've done it too. So it's, <laughs> you know, and I think all of us have. You yeah. know what I mean? So I still, it, yeah. You I know, don't know. It, it, I, I want them to invent those cars that can, right. you know, back to the future, yeah, do yeah. all kinds of things. Yeah, yeah go like underwater, a, fly. 007. Yeah, yeah, Why do not? it all, do it all. They could, they could but those all. are things, but really the ping alert from MEMA is, is very, very useful. Yeah. And you can have, put it on your kid's phone. You can actually, you so can. So what does it actually, can, what does it sound like? Um, and does it does it make a noise? You pick a, like a, I mean, like if it's a it's a hazardous alert, it goes. Oh, it's rawr, different. Rawr, oh, yeah, rawr. that's the emergency. Yeah, so that's the sound, system. and then some of it's like ping. You know, oh, like it'll but, be a little. But, but that you can like set, a text. No, but you can set your notifications, so it's like any other app. You can go in and say, well, you know, if it's in Hopkinton, I want it to do the. Rawr, rawr. Oh, okay. You okay. know, if it's in in so Wayland you, or Weston, then I want it to do ping. Yeah, or whatever you can pick up. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you so can, you could adjust it. You to can something adjust that it, would... um, and it's, but they they definitely and they give you the actual alert, you know, and it tells yeah. you, and it's I I love it, but okay, you know, <laughs> cool. Yeah, very cool. So right. and you know, obviously avoidance is the best thing, and I should say preparedness comes into play with this. So before a flood, you know, of course stay stay alert and understand what weather's coming your way mm -hmm. um determine your weather for home school work mm -hmm. um, that are likely to flood learn which roadways are most likely to flood and choose or find or know an alternative work um, route to yep. take a create a communications plan with your family mm -hmm. um i have a app on celia's phone i know where she is Cool. With GPS yeah, all the time. I would like to do that. So, too. yeah, you know, I'll be like, hey, sweetie, something's going on. You know what I mean? So, assembly an emergency kit so you have a, a yeah, kit that's in your a good car. Idea. One thing I will say about floods if you do have power windows and your car does stall, I would Open. have, no, oh. I'd, I'd have a window breaker, breaker a hammer little hammer thing. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have a little um, CO2 one. They have a bunch of different ones. They're mm -hmm. like 10 bucks. That's worth that's having idea. in your car. Because if, yeah, if you get stuck in the car, you can get out. Yeah. Um, and then just have all your stuff together, you know, mm -hmm. charge your phone. If you know it's going to be incumbent weather, yep. things like that. So but, it's emergency prep. I love yep, it. Yep. So and, this is, this again is yep. advice, heavy rain. Turn your headlights on. Yep. It's a new law. Yep. Leave twice as much space between you and the car in front. Yep. Um, if your steering feels light, you're probably aquaplaning. Hydroplaning. Yep. This is this is an article from Britain, so they call it aquaplaning. Um, as it's <laughs> ease off the accelerator. Yep. If you break down, don't prop the bonnet open. The which bonnet. Is the hood. It's oh, a, well, it's don't a British just... article. Yes. Don't prop open the bonnet while you wait. <laughs> Rain soak electrics can make it harder to stop the engine. So anyway, yeah, don't put the hood up chance. because then you're going to flood your car from the rain. Right. And right. then don't drive into, this says don't drive into flood water that's more than four inches deep, which I know I was in more But British four. cars are kind of lower. Maybe it's on the Aston Martin. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, They're mini, drive slowly yeah. and steadily so you don't make a bow wave. Oops. <laughs> Test your brain. The that's bow wave does not yeah. work. So yeah. then it says... This says if you do get stuck in flood water, best to wait in the car. This is the one that was the what? Yeah. Oh. And then, yeah. then driving fast in water is dangerous, inconsiderate, and can end up being very inexpensive. Expensive. Um, it only <laughs> takes an egg cup full. Who measures in an egg cup? I don't know. <laughs> Who egg did cup this full research? Of water yeah. To be sucked into your engine to ruin it. Manhole got okay. So this is some of the things I was. And the end, the flood waters can be contaminated. Yeah. So if you're walking in that. Yeah. Cold water reduces muscle strength. All kinds of things can happen. So I love the idea of being prepared. I think yep. that's the best that's, that's thing. That's your best. Yep. So on that note, <laughs> be prepared. Boy Scouts have it right. Yep. And um, we'll be back in a minute with Chris Martell to talk about what's up in the sky in the summertime. See you soon. <laughs> Thank you.
Welcome back. So we are very excited to have with us Chris Martell, who has an awesome t-shirt on. It says Space I made him take off his jacket awesome. because his t-shirt is so great. Yeah. Um, awesome. And so I became <laughs> aware that you knew something about this because you did a program at the library on a Wednesday night that I couldn't go to because I was here. So can we, you tell yeah. us about that and about what we might see in the sky? Sure, we did. We had a great turnout, too. Yeah. It was a snowy night in January, and we still had, uh, I think, about 50 or 60 people really? actually make it to the library. That's yeah. awesome. It's a lot of fun. Um, so the library has a, uh, a telescope, basically. It yeah. was donated by the Friends of the Library. It's a nice little telescope tabletop model that um, people, patron, patrons can check out of the library yeah uh, just like a book really so, i love that um, so cool yeah, it is. It is, it's a pretty nice little telescope it's yeah. modified made pretty much so it's not completely indestructible but pretty much so yeah i would hope so we don't want people to take it and break it yeah <laughs> yeah we have yeah because we have kids that are sure. touching it and things like that so yeah. we make sure that everything is um that is so locked cool. down is in really good um, uh, condition we yeah. check it out every time to make sure everything's working properly yeah but uh it's, yeah it's a great little telescope and you can see quite a few things up in the night sky so yeah. do you know the magnification not that i would um yeah it's it's not a really you don't really need high oh. magnification for mm -hmm. astronomy okay mm -hmm. um a lot of the things that we look at in the sky are actually quite large right cool. um like you see them if you use the uh the size of the moon to compare to some of the objects like the andromeda galaxy is very easy to see and it's about you know much larger actually than the moon wow um, you just can't see it because our eyes can't collect that much light oh. so quickly so you can see it through the telescope? You can see it pretty well through oh the telescope. Oh, my goodness. They're kind of my favorite objects through the telescope, though, are things called globular clusters. Really? Where you'll have thousands and thousands of stars collected down. in a, um, like a, uh, like a ball. Mm -hmm. And you see lots of stars um, uh, radiating out from that, that cluster. Mm -hmm. And they're very bright. They're very easy to see. Mm -hmm. And they're fantastic in a telescope. Cool. That is cool. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to look for those globular I'm, structures. I know, I'm so excited. <laughs> Cluster. <laughs> yeah. So, so I use an app called Sky, Sky Gazer, which I yes. love because it's like yes. kind of fun. And um, being from Idaho, I'm from Idaho, the sky, the sky gazing oh, sure. is quite magnificent out there. Yeah, good oh, sky. Yes, because yeah, yeah. there's not a lot of light pollution. Yeah. And sadly, the lunar eclipse that's coming up is not really viewable to us, correct? Right. That's more in the south towards Africa and yeah. Asia. Yeah. Yeah. But we have a full moon Friday. Yeah. Full moon Friday. <laughs> and actually, right now, when you go outside, before the sun is even completely down, you can see some, some bright things that look like stars. They're actually planets. Right. Really? Um, if yeah. you look into the west, where the sun is going down, you'll see a yeah. bright object there. And that's actually Venus. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so Venus is very bright this time of year. And then just a little further towards the south, you'll actually see Jupiter. Yep. Wow. Uh, so that's very prominent. And now this is a good time of year because now Saturn is up as well in the south. And right behind it is Mars. Oh, and Sa wow. So Saturn's near Jupiter and Mars. Are they forming a, like a triangle or there's there are three? No, they're pretty, they're far apart. They kind of... Um, flow along a line called the ecliptic. So they're not really, you know, they, although they may look close together, when you look at them in the sky, mm -hmm. they're actually, you know, so tens is that of like an millions of miles apart. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, so they're pretty far apart. And Mars, so when I look at, when I look at planets, I think of planets as not twinkly. 
They're right. just solid light. That's exactly right. Venus yeah. is very bright white. Mars mm -hmm. is a little orangey, pinky. Yeah. Red. Yeah. Red. Yeah. Yeah. And then how do you, I don't really know what Saturn and Jupiter look like. I know Venus and I know Mars. If Saturn and Jupiter, I know it's a planet. Is there any way we can, because we can't see the rings from here. Actually, with, with, a with a the library telescope, yeah. Jupiter yeah. is a perfect target. Whoa. You can not only see the bands on Jupiter, it's a large, it's the largest planet in our solar system. Yeah. And it's very large, it's a ga considered a gas giant, yeah. wasn't quite big enough to actually become a star in its own right. And oh. um, you can actually see a number of the moons around Jupiter through with the, the telescope. Ooh, maybe we need to... To yeah. check out the yeah. telescope. Yeah. <laughs> so wait, so you so you're saying Jupiter is a gas giant. It wasn't big enough to be considered a star? Well, it wasn't big it enough to collapse on it. itself and actually allow um, fusion to occur. You'd need a very large body, a large body of, of gas or, or mass that um, has sufficient gravity to cause fusion inside. Wow. So that's wow. how the star kind of bursts into I life. I did not know that. Yeah. So, so it's just not big enough. So it would never, yeah, it's just yeah, not no, the it's, size. It's, it's too small. And Saturn is the one with the rings, yes. the ringed planet. But you yeah. can't see, so what I'm saying is from here with the naked eye, yeah. you can't really tell the, it's hard for me. No. You can't. So no, it's not the just, only way you could tell is if you use your, your Sky Guide or yeah. another app. There's yeah. dozens of them out so there. Yeah, that are what free. are some of the? So there's Sky Guide. What's yeah. another? Yeah, I have. Um, sky I know David View. Had some sky sky View, View is another one. Yeah. There, there. If you just type in, go to Night the App sky. Store. Night Sky. Yeah. If you go into the the, uh, and they'll also point out the constellations. And it's kind of cool. You just objects. put it up. Yep. And yeah, it yeah. Shows you. Do we have any exactly. constellations here right yeah. now? Um, yeah, <laughs> there is. Just a couple of stars right here. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in a, in a, in very a, good. But yeah, in a sun over here. But I'm, I'm, I'm more of a globular. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so it shows you all of the. I think yes. it's really cool. It, it really is. Yeah, and it's I mean, really I think that's so fascinating. Use. And you use it like when you're outside, and you can just see different light. Yeah. And if you have so something bigger like amazing. an iPad, more people can oh, see it around you. Oh, that's a good and it idea. It's the same way. That's why I did when my yeah. nephews were here. We that's were a great idea. In the backyard. Yeah, and, it's a lot of fun. So yeah. I know what's up there now is Big Dipper is kind of west. Yep. Right, and then. Yes. Well, it's Cygnus? more yeah northwest. Yeah. Northwest. Let me see you and see, so this goes. <laughs> this sees through the building. Yeah. Well, no. it's just a positional thing. It's, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Can't yeah. see. Draco. <laughs> so Draco is a dragon. Yeah. Yes. And then Cygnus is a swan somewhere. Right. Cygnus is over on yeah, the uh, east. Yeah. Cygnus is right here. East. Yeah. So Cygnus is to the east. <laughs> Draco is is Draco the dragon on the west? Yeah. yeah. Draco is right there. So, or north. And the, the Big North? Dipper, actually, we call it the Big Dipper yeah. because it's, it's so easy to spot in the sky. It's yeah. actually con considered what's called an asterism. It's just a smaller part of, a whole con of the actual constellation Ursa Major. Yeah, so I didn't know bear. it was an asterism. So, I've yeah, never even heard that word. And that's pretty, we, we use or we recognize the asterisms more than we do the constellations because the constellations are so large in the so sky. So an asterism is a small part of a constellation. Yeah, yes. Okay. That is yeah. cool. Yeah. Not a small part of an asteroid. So what's your favorite to look at? Um, you know, I go back and forth. I, I have a telescope in my backyard. Sometimes when my neighbors go walking down the street at night, they'll see me out there. Yeah. And um, I like to look at, at primarily galaxies and nebulae, which mm -hmm. is nebula is often like a, so uh, you a can star see that's it. exploded. And you see all the gas and the dust that's moving away from the explosion. And okay. they're all different colors. And it's really fun. Yeah. Uh, so I use a camera, a special camera, to take pictures mm -hmm. of them. Really? And um, hmm. it's... We actually uh, do shows at different libraries, showing our pictures at different libraries, Ooh. and when just you to get people back interested. To um, I can do it pretty much any time. So I'll have to I talk can, to the library. Yeah, yeah. yeah. not Get Wednesday. him back. Yeah, <laughs> that is so cool, though. So it's it's the perfect STEM subject if you're into oh you know, science, technology. I think everyone's and interested because right. it's it's there all the time. It's always there. And, and yeah. the other thing is, so much of mythology, and all Stems other cultures. From connect to stars oh yeah because you yes. know i was thinking um use in, it for navigation for yeah. religion and for so there was um the the recent animated movie where they had maui and they talked about um oh. maui's hook yes. you know that, that you right. just have yeah. to go toward that and i know in polynesian countries they look at that as their culture they look at that as the hook maui's hook um but 
we talk about it as the Scorpio or Scorpius right. constellation. Mm-hmm. So different different cultures, cultures see it in different, different ways. Images. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is they see the same shapes. That's what I'm right. saying. And that's an, an interesting thing. Mm. Uh, when I was in Hawaii, I got to listen in on a few lectures about the different constellations and kind of the, the, the stories that went behind them uh, with the Pleiades and yes. things like that. It's yes. just, it's fascinating. So Pleiades is one of the ones I remember, Seven yeah. Sisters. They're exactly. very small together. So what is the story in Hawaii? Do you remember? Uh, you it? would have to ask me, wouldn't you? Sorry. So, <laughs> no, sorry. But I know I, I, I've heard it called the Seven Sisters. Yes. So somewhere in some, you know, Roman Greek mythology, mm-hmm. Seven Sisters somehow are thrown right. up in the sky. I don't know. And the other thing, um, the, in, the, in the Polynesian country, the thing next to it, they're calling it a teapot. Um, and, and that's actually Sagittarius. It's Sagittarius. So, so mm. they see it as a teapot in the Polynesian country. We're looking at it as, you know, the horns of the goat, Sagittarius. To me, it looks a lot more like a teapot when yeah. you look at it. Yeah, when it's you actually look at in, it, the, yeah. in that part of the sky, which is part of our Milky Way, out of our galaxy, it's just really rich with a, a of number different. of great stars and great nebulae. And, yeah. and it's, uh, it's a very colorful region of the sky. So what is a nebulae? Nebulae can be from a number of different things, but primarily it's gas and dust uh-huh. that have um, either in Orion, the great uh, Orion Nebula, there's a lot of gas and dust there that's collecting to form new stars. Oh. There's a, a star nursery a, going how on. How does this sto- stars form? How do they, like what is the science behind it? I'm just curious. Well, you get the glue. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We need a tutorial. Though. <laughs> they go to. They go to the. Um, it takes billions of years yeah. for and this. To, it's basically gravity. Heat and gravity. Gravity that it's pulls moving. things together, yeah. and it starts to spin and form. And as it, the the heavier objects, you know, form the center first. Mm-hmm. And when you have more mass, then more gravity and more dust starts to pull in. Yeah. So it just evolves over millions and. And that's formation you know, of planets. Of years. Yeah. Everything. Right. And then the question is, where did the dust come from? The dust in the first place. Well, that well, what we see now a lot of is it's dust that came from exploding stars. Okay. But then you can ask where do the stars come? Yeah, from? Yeah, I know you and can just keep going back and explode? forth. Yeah. Well, that goes back to the big. You know, <laughs> why do they explode? Why do they explode? <laughs> yeah. Uh, they get old, basically. Yeah, they get mad. <laughs> yeah. I had enough of this. I'm out of here. <laughs> Run, runs out of um, elements to fuse. It basically stops on iron, and when it can no longer fuse the other elements, then it. It uh, overheats basically and explodes. Hmm. So, interesting. But where does it all come from? The Big Bang. That's the the theory that everyone believes that it came from uh, right now. Just one big explosion. Everything was hydrogen at first in the uh, universe, and then it began to create other elements through you know, a variety of, of processes. The stars forming, stars can actually create elements and. It gets pretty involved. That's so interesting. Yeah. Is, is this astrophysics? What yeah. is this? Yeah, okay. Well, a cosmology is a okay. study of kind of the formation Cosmos. of the universe. Yeah. So, uh, what's the largest telescope that you've seen that oh, you've looked through? Because I know you, you yeah. know you're. you're uh, we went to the one at, that's at Harvard. I yes. think a long time ago, which was yeah. Was, yeah. was amazing. It what is. It's a beautiful through. one. It's a fairly famous one too. Yeah. Harvard is one of the most famous astronomy uh, locations in the world actually. Wow. Mm-hmm. Because it started so long ago. The largest one I've looked through actually was at a, a peak in, in California called Mount Wilson mm-hmm. where they have a 60 inch telescope. It's a reflector, it's a mirror, it's a different type. But it was one of the, uh, one of the ones that was used to realize that our universe was expanding. Cool. Really? Uh, back around 1920 or so. So wow. it's, uh, I snuck into a party, a private party that was going <laughs> like, on, and it was dark. Good, hey, it's that's night. That's a good crap. Yeah, yeah. You know, d- snuck in and waited in line. Shirt and yeah. nobody, <laughs> nobody asked me for any anything, so I just went you in looked and like looked you through the telescope. There. That, oh, yeah. That's amazing. And then they had to pull me away from the eyepiece because it was... So what were you looking Because you, you were you fascinated. You I remember, everything. like it was yesterday, it was Saturn, and you could see a moon moving across. It's called transiting, moving across Saturn, and you could see the shadow wow. that it was uh, putting on, on Saturn. It was pretty amazing. That is so cool. Yeah. I know. I went to yeah. um, the Corning Glass Museum in New York. Yes. has mm-hmm. that, the big Tubble, uh, tubble Hubble telescope yeah. lens, and that's where they made that, and they... They had a little, I think, that did they have a telescope there? But they definitely had 
pictures that showed you that how that magnification was created and the two lenses that were put together or something yeah. and all of that is just fascinating and yeah. telescopes have been around for a very very long time so well, it's Galileo like Galileo was yeah. the first yeah. one in the 1600s yeah so how did I mean like how did you invent I mean like it's so interesting that well, they were playing with, with lenses for glasses, and Galileo said, hey, how about if I put this on the end of a tube and another one and kind of look through it? And, <laughs> Can and I see longer? Yeah. Farther. yeah. I'm sure the view wasn't that great. Right. But it was but it enough started, to show that yeah. there's things out there that you can't see with the naked eye. Right. One of the first that's things amazing. he looked at was Jupiter, and he saw the moons. Wow. And so that's when we realized that there's, like, a we're whole, not alone. Yeah. You know, there's a whole new universe out there that we haven't explored yet. Yeah. Can you imagine that? Is that 500? When was Galileo? 1600s. Okay, I don't yeah, know, 16, remember the exact year. Early 1600s. 1630s. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. Might have yeah. another round of throwing pressure. Can you talk about white light pollution? And I can't even see the Milky Way around. Yes, uh, yeah. light pollution is a is a real problem. In Idaho, it was it's amazing because we go it's, to the City of the Rocks, which is wilderness. Well, that in order to yeah. see the eclipse uh, in 2017, I had to go to Idaho for that. Wow! Yeah. Uh, so I did. That was uh, a big deal. My oh, friends yes. were renting out their houses for like two thousand dollars a night. Yes, I didn't pay that much. <laughs> no. We actually found a guy in a beautiful spot who didn't even Where did you know go? that there was an eclipse. Driggs, <gasps> Idaho. Oh, you know. Perfect. Perfect. That's like 30 miles from where oh, I Oh, really? Out. Yeah. Well, it's right in, it was right in the Driggs path of great. totality. Yeah. Perfect. And what we did yeah. was Driggs is perfect. for uh, about a two years, the people that I went with, we looked at all the data to find out where in the country in the path of totality would be the highest probability of yeah. no clouds. That's amazing. And it was Driggs, Idaho. Yeah. So that's where we yeah. went. Amazing. And that's where Grand Targhee is. It's like yes. where the Tetons are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Between Wyoming and Idaho. So we it's gorgeous some, there anyway. Some yeah. fantastic I pictures of the yeah. eclipse. Yeah. Yeah. That's but amazing. But light pollution is a huge problem, yeah. especially yeah. here in the east. It is. Yes. Uh, yeah. We can't see the Milky Way on a really great night. I can just about make it out. So our skies are are not as bad as Boston, but certainly nowhere yeah. near we the way it is in Idaho. Though, yeah. The darkest location really in Massachusetts is out towards the western part yeah. of Western Mass, yeah. Berkshires. In the Berkshires. And, the Berkshires. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and even then, it's still not like Idaho, oh, unfortunately. Yeah. It's, well, only 10% Because there's of no Idaho. big city well, yeah, with is, all the ambient light. And there's mountains, but there's only 10% of the land is populated. There's right. only like 400 people in the whole <laughs> state, I think. So <laughs> we, like we're a little over a million. But <laughs> there's, yeah. There are 399. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's here now. Yeah, I moved here a long time ago. <laughs> No, yeah. but it's amazing oh, when we, seconds. yeah. Oh. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate Any it. It's so exciting. Yeah. Yep. Anytime. And we would love to, we'd love to see you back at the library sometime. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Cause and I'm definitely going to talk about Get out about there. Yeah. Get, yeah. get out there, check out the sky, get yeah. one of those little apps on your phone. I, I'm just fascinated. And uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah. And we'll thank you, you so much. We thank won't you. be on next week. It'll be a repeat. Thanks for having me. We'll see yeah. you the week after. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Thank you. That was so now I want to wow. go. Wow. Isn't it? This you